what a great promise you've given to us in your word. Especially in those times of great difficulty, those times of struggles. Problems come crashing into our lives unexpectedly. And you're right there with us, reminding us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Thank you, our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Thank you. <laughs> well, as Ralph said, we're going to start a new series. I have no idea how long this is going to be. It really depends on you. <clears throat> because I'm going to talk about God's answer to life's problems. Now, I know most of you have no problems, but the two or three of you that do have a problem, what I'm asking you to do is open up that worship folder. You'll find a little piece of paper in there that says, My problem and my question. Now, we don't want any names. But whatever problem you may be going through or a friend of yours may be going through, just write that down and then write down a question that you have about that problem. And then we'll look at the scriptures to find out what God has to say about that problem. In churches in the past that I've served, we used to have when we had evening services, we had what I called the Ask the Pastor Night. And so I just collect a bunch of questions and I just stand up there answering questions. Sometimes we just get the questions off from the floor, and what is God saying about this issue or that issue? So this is what we'll end up doing probably. I'll take a number of those problems, and we'll go through that. And then the ones I have remaining, if I have a stack like that, well, it might take two Sunday mornings, and I'll just start going through and just share with you what God has to say about that specific issue. Now, the, the, the big umbrella is God's answer to life's problems. What I want to do is take a small section of that until I get your problems, and I want to share with you my problem. And one of my problems is the ways of God. And I'm trying to figure out the ways of God, and I haven't gotten it down yet. And even though you don't have that same problem I do, I'm going to share with you my problem today and probably next week and the next week and the next week. How in the world are we supposed to understand the very ways of God when the Apostle Paul doesn't understand them, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. His ways are so unsearchable. They are so unfathomable. How can you understand the ways of God? Well, that's what we want to look into this morning. You see, last week, my wife and I celebrated our 48th wedding anniversary. And that was after, now we realize we got married, I was 11, she was 10, right? But we had gone together for seven years. She came out of a junior high school, that's when I first met her. She just graduated from junior high school, and I was my, finished my first year of high school. So we went together for seven years, on and off type of a thing, you know, breaking up, going back, breaking up, going back, that you might remember those days. And after seven years, when we stood before the pastor and we said, I do, I thought, man, I know everything I need to know about Linda. <laughs> She's probably thinking the same thing. However, as the weeks and the months and the years passed, we both came to the conclusion as we didn't know what we didn't know about one another. And it's taken 48 years and we're still trying to understand one another. But we... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but we know each other better today than we did when we first said, I do. As I thought of that situation, I thought, that's how it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you hear about Jesus Christ. You hear that he loves you. You hear that he died for your sins. And you are convicted in your heart. And you know that you need a Savior. And so after that courtship of may, might be months or it might be years, finally you come to the altar of sacrifice and you say, I do receive you, Jesus, as my personal Savior. And if anyone were to ask you, do you know Jesus? You'd say, yes, I do. But you don't know what you don't know about Jesus. Because that's just the beginning. That is the new birth. And there's a whole life of learning to know 
who he is. And one of the things you and I have to start learning about him are his ways. In fact, he has told us in his scriptures through the prophet Isaiah that my ways are not your ways. Neither are your thoughts my thoughts, says the Lord. But as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and your ways, my thoughts and your thoughts. You see, God doesn't think like us. God doesn't act like us. And that's where the confusion comes in. Because we feel that he should behave on our terms. He should think and see things just as we do. And he tells us in the Word that that is not the case. Case in point. One of the first times you come across this kind of a situation is in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, Samuel is the priest. In fact, he is the last of the judges and the actually the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. And the Israelites are asking for a king, and God says to Samuel, go and anoint a king. So he anoints Saul. Now Saul starts out pretty well at the beginning, but shortly after he has the same kind of a problem that a lot of children have, and that is he doesn't understand obedience. He doesn't think like God thinks. He doesn't do things as God wants him to do them. And so he begins this life of disobedience and walking away from God, doing things on his own terms, just like so many of us do. In fact, just to give you an understanding of what he was thinking when Samuel told him, you go down near the Gilgal, you wait for seven days, and then I will come there. And recall that only the priests were allowed to offer up sacrifices to God, not the king. We are told that Samuel, when he arrives, he hears this bleeding of sheep, and he's wondering what in the world's going on, and he confronts King Saul. King Saul says, well, I, I, I thought now that the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So, so I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. What he was saying is I felt compelled to go against the will of God for my life. I felt compelled to disobey God because I was looking around, and I saw all the problems around here, and I thought i got to do something about it. But that's the way man thinks. Rather than calling on God and waiting upon God, we think we have to do something about it, and we do something about it, and we get ourselves into deep trouble. And so Samuel responds, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the command that the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Now, here's the result. But now, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people, because you have not obeyed the Lord's command. Saul, you were small in your eyes when God raised you up. And now you're starting to do things on your own. And because of your disobedience, God is looking for another king who will take your place. You could have had a dynasty, but you've blown it. And now he's looking for a man after his own heart. And so God sends Samuel out on assignment number two. Assignment number one was to anoint Saul as king. Assignment number two is to anoint someone else as king. And he says, I'll show you who it is. Go up to Bethlehem, go to the house of Jesse, and uh, anoint one of his sons, and I'll tell you who the son will be. And so he goes up to Bethlehem, and he gathers the sons of Jesse around. There are eight sons. Seven of them were there on campus at that point. And he looks at the very first son, and as soon as he sees Eliab, he thinks, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> Surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. Now, how could he come to that conclusion? He only had one other king to compare Eliab with, and that was King Saul. And the Bible tells us that King Saul was head and shoulders above all of his peers. And so Eliab must have been tall. He must have been strong, powerful. He must have looked kingly. And so Samuel came to the conclusion, this is the one. Man, this was an easy responsibility. I go up there, the first guy that shows up, hit the king. God says, not so fast, Samuel, not so fast. I have rejected him. This is not the one that I want. I am convinced that if you and I had been Samuel, we would have done exactly the same thing because that's how we think. 
If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it has to be a duck. And if this man walks like a king and he, and he appears to be very, very kingly, he must be God's anointed. God says, not so fast. And then he goes on to tell Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. You ever run into this situation where you make a decision based on appearance? I mean, how many used cars have you bought? They look so great. Man, clean, sparkling. You open up the hood. Yeah, that's an engine. Don't know anything about it, but must be it right there. And you look at the tires, and even the tires are clean. Wow, this must be the Lord's anointed for me to drive around for a while. And you take it off the parking lot, and the next day you get up and... What in the world has gone on? Well, you just bought yourself a lemon. Because you made a decision based on the appearance, not on the reality. Rick and Allie, just, they're on their way back to Michigan, and then eventually back to Beijing. And when they arrived, they had all this luggage. And I saw this one big piece of luggage. And he goes to pick it up, and all of a sudden he's holding the handle in his hand. And, Where'd you get that, Rick? Uh, paid 15 bucks in China, brand new. <laughs> Look, he's like, guess I got what I paid for. There's some things in China that are even better than what you can get here in the States, but not everything. And so if you ever buy luggage from China, check it out first. We look at things that look so wonderful, so good, and then we find out later, man, did I ever make a mistake. This is what God is basically telling Samuel. He goes on to say, the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In other words, Samuel, don't make decisions on outward appearance. Make decisions based on character. I'm looking for the man. I'm looking for the woman of character, someone who has given themselves to me and allows my Holy Spirit to mold their lives, to, to smooth out the rough edges, to build into them. That's the kind of person I can use. I'm not looking for the most attractive, the most beautiful, the most handsome, the, the most powerful, the most educated. That's not who I'm looking for. I'm looking for a man or a woman after my own, my own heart. And so after he goes through all seven sons, he asked Jesse, is that it? And Jesse said, well, we got a little run out there taking care of sheep. Fine, you bring him in. And God says, that's the man that I am choosing to be the next king. So if this is true, if this is the basic principle of Scripture, that God is primarily looking for character rather than outward appearance, where do we go from here? And the answer to that question is we need to focus on our character. We need to focus on the inner person. If we're going to be pleasing to God and if we're going to get anywhere in our spiritual lives. And so with that in mind, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and see what the Apostle Peter has to say about this inner self. Because he makes some statements here that bothered me for a while. He wasn't understanding exactly what he was talking about, and the more I got into it, the more excited I became. Remember, we've been in the book of James, so just take two right turns and you'll get to 2 Peter. Verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Do you believe that? Everything you need to do what God wants you to do, you already have. His divine power has given us all that we need to be the man or the woman in Jesus Christ that He wants us to be. And then he goes on to say, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, through those wonderful promises, 
through them you may participate, you may fellowship with, you may have koinonia with the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Wow. What is this divine nature that we can participate in? Remember the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, all things become new. It's like your eyes are open. You start thinking different thoughts. You start behaving differently, and you're not even sure why these changes are taking place in your life. And it's because you have a new capacity. The Bible refers to that as the new self or the new man. It refers to the old life as the old nature, the old capacity, the sinful nature. And we are told that the world is filled with corruption, the world system. Now, our old nature desires actually wants that corruption, wants to partake of that corruption, wants to be like everybody else, wants the philosophy and wants the value system of the world. That is the sinful nature. However, the Bible tells us that because we have this new nature, this new capacity, that we are repulsed. In that new capacity, we are repulsed at the corruption of the world. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7 that the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. The things that I really want to do, I don't do. Why? It is sin that dwells within me. It is that Adamic nature, that, that old self that strives and, and seeks after the corruption of the world. But when you and I allow the Holy Spirit to start changing our character... And allow that new capacity, that new nature to take over. We begin to escape from the corruption of the world. Now, the fact that we have all of that. He says you have to go further. And this is what he tells us. For this very reason. Because of what you already possess. Because of this very reason. Make every effort. To add to your faith. Mm -hmm. I thought faith was all that you needed. No, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. How do you do this? Well, you make every effort. It says with diligence. You put your mind and your heart and your soul into becoming a better person. Not by gritting your teeth, but just resigning yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Allowing Him to start taking control of the various areas of your life. Even of your thought life. The, the, even of your tongue. Uh, even of your eyes. The things you see. And, and, and your ears. The things you are willing to hear. And you allow Him to start working in that character of yours. And, and develop that. So do that with diligence. And then he says, with diligence, add. Now that is a very interesting word, add. It's a word from which we get the term chorus or choreography. The choreogra choreographer of ancient Greek, Greece was the individual who gathered the actors together for the Greek tragedies. And he was responsible to pay for all the costumes, to pay for all the equipment, everything that was needed to produce the Greek tragedies. He had to supply everything for them. In fact, the Bible tells us that, or I should say in, in ancient Greece, he had to fully supply, and here he, uh, Peter uses that term, fully supply, increase all of this, because you're building upon faith. Add to your faith. Now, when I first saw that, the thought that came to my mind was a computer. Because every computer has an operating system, right? You know, started out with a PC, the MS-DOS. How many of you remember MS-DOS? Remember the, all the commands? Okay. You start with MS-DOS, and then all of a sudden we got Windows. Wow, you can move this stuff around. That's really neat. And then you got Windows 95 and Windows 97. You get Millennium, and you get the XP, and now Vista. 
which crashes all the time. But that's, that's out there. If you're one of the Mac users, you have uh, all kinds of OSs, and now we're up to OS 10. And, and when I bought my Mac, I had the OS 10 uh, Tiger, and now I have the OS 10 Leopard. Oh, wow. But that's the operating system. Now imagine you have a brand new commu computer, you have this wonderful operating system, and you turn it on and you look and say, it doesn't do anything. And I come up and say, well, do you have any software in there? What do you mean by software? Well, you know, like programs you put in there. Do you have any finance program like uh, Excel? Uh, no, never heard of that one. Don't have that one. In. What do you have, a, a word processor like, 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 like MS Word? And, no, never put that one in there. Well, do you like photography? I love photography. Oh, well, okay, so do you have a photographic uh, software program? No, don't have that. Well, what are you doing with just an OS system? You'd never think of buying a computer unless it had some software that goes with it, and then you start putting more software. That's what he's talking about. He says, faith is your operating system. It is the beginning. And if you want to function properly, you have to start putting some software in there. And he comes up with seven pieces of software. We call them virtues or, or qualities. And this is what he says. Add to your faith goodness. That's number one. That deals with moral purity. And you know, the problem we run into today is that so many Christians today say, I believe the Bible and I have Christ as my Savior, but their moral lives are in shambles. Because they're like King Saul. They're doing things their own way. And they're allowing themselves to be controlled by the old nature, that old capacity, rather than the new capacity that God has given them. And they wonder why they have so many new problems. It's because they're run running under the flesh rather than running under the operation of the Holy Spirit. So add moral goodness to your life. I was shocked when I saw on the news this past week that there, up in New England there are 12-year-old girls who are taking naked pictures of themselves and then sending them over the Internet to the boyfriends. Now that's bad, but when their parents were confronted with this information, they said, so what? What's the big deal? There is no moral compass. And that's what the world operates on today. No moral compass. And so you start out with your operating system by putting some goodness in there. Some moral values. Moral virtue. After goodness, he says, add knowledge. Now, this is knowledge of who God is. And the only way you can get knowledge of God, or one of the major ways of getting knowledge of God is the have knowledge of the Scriptures. If you don't know the Scriptures, you don't really know God. As you read the Scriptures, you begin to understand the ways of God and the thoughts of God and the ways He operates in the affairs of mankind. Usually on Thursdays, I meet with these guys, uh, some of these Broncos guys over at the uh, Broncos headquarters, and we've been going through the first five books of the Bible, then we went through Joshua, and we just started the book of Judges uh, this past Thursday. And I found something very interesting in the book of Judges. And I, in fact, I only, I, I built on just this one verse during that hour session. And it's Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. Because Joshua goes into the land seven years to take over the land. They take over the land. And we are told that Joshua and his generation pass. And as long as Joshua was alive in his generation, they were obeying the Lord. But after his generation passes, this is what we are told. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, and by the way, that's very literal. If you ever go over to Jerusalem there, you will find uh, areas where they had these, all these bones of, uh, of, of all the ancestors. And what they do is they, they, they lay the body there, and then after a year you have the decay, and then they gather the bones, and they take it, into the family area of all the bones, and then they put this person in with the other bones, and they are literally gathered to their fathers. So, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what He had done for Israel. Think about that. The wonderful miracles, the crossing of the Red Sea, even the crossing of the Jordan River. The ten plagues there in, in, in Egypt. Uh, getting water out of a rock twice. 
uh, feeding them manna day after day after day, and their clothes did not wear out for 40 years. All these wonderful things this new generation knew nothing about because the parents were not carrying out the Shema. Hear, O Israel, our God is one. And these are the things that you are to teach to your children. They did not teach them to their children. And at the end of the book of Judges, there's a verse that says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Isn't that the USA in 2008? No absolute truth. What is true to you may not be true to me. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. We won't judge one another. We will be tolerant of every kind of behavior, every kind of attitude, every kind of belief system, so that we can all do what is right in our own eyes because there is no standard. And so that's why Peter says you have to add to your faith goodness and then build on that goodness by knowing the Scriptures, becoming saturated with the Word of God so you have a standard and you know what is right and you know what is wrong. And then he says, also, add to the knowledge self-control. This is discipline. This is keeping those passions under control. This is saying, even though I want to do this, I will not do that because I know it's going to get me in a lot of trouble and I know it's not pleasing to the Lord and I know it's not going to help me to to build up in my faith. And so you add that discipline. And then he says to add, on top of the discipline, you are to add perseverance. <laughs> Hupa meno. Hupa means under, meno means to remain. When you start disciplining your life, whether it's your body or your mind or your spirit, when you are disciplining your life, that's hard work because there's so many things you want to do. And you have to say, I, I want to eat that, but I'm... Mm. Perseverance, perseverance, hupamenos. Just get under that thing and don't let it control you. Perseverance. When you're ready to give up, know you hang in there. Because you know God's in control. And He will never let go. He will never let go. He will never let go. And then, on top of the perseverance, He says, add godliness. Two more Greek words. The first Greek word means well. The second Greek word means to worship. Godliness is worshiping the true God, worshiping Him well, worshiping Him with reverence, respect, awe. Putting the all back into the awesome God. Wow. And then as you focus on God and you are worshiping God not only on a Sunday morning, but day after day after day in your own quiet time or just driving down the street, you can be worshiping God. Then he says, add something else, because the Bible tells us that we are to, in fact, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and your neighbor as yourself. So after you worship him well with reverence and respect, then you can focus on your neighbor and love your brother. Philos Adelphos, Philadelphia, the city of Brotherly Shove today. That's basically what it is. I have lived there for four years. To be the city of Brotherly Love, because we love one another. We're willing to go out of our way for one another. And then he concludes and wraps the whole package up with love. And this is the agape love. This is the self-sacrificing, self-giving the other-centered kind of love. Not asking what you can do for me, but what can I do for you. Not asking what the church can do for you, but what can you can do for the church. Not asking God, what can you do for me, but Lord, what can I do for you. It is giving up your rights. It is giving up your desires in order to please or to meet the need of somebody else and to please your Father who is in heaven. Wow, that's quite a list. And there's a good result after you go through that list. If you're willing to build upon that operating system, all this software, these seven wonderful qualities. He says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure. In other words, not just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but it keeps on building up over the years. 
It's like my relationship with my wife builds up over the years. Our understanding of one another builds up over the years. Our love for one another builds up over the years. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. That's the negative way to look at it. Let's look at it from the positive way. It will encourage you to become active, getting off of the bench onto the playing field. And it will encourage you and enable you to become productive or fruitful in your relationship with other people, in your own relationship with God, in your growth, in your development. You will be productive. It was Jesus who said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you, that you should go and be productive, bear much fruit, and therefore glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is the way to build upon what God has already given us, this new capacity, this wonderful capacity, the desire of pleasing God, the desire of wanting to do the right thing. Let me quickly just summarize what we've talked about this morning. The ways of God, it's all in your favor. It's your, for your benefit. Because when you go the way of God and start working on your character, you don't have to worry about, do I look okay? <laughs> Am I good enough for God? Am I dressed properly to, to come here to church? You don't have to worry about all those outward appearances. You don't have to worry about how wealthy or how poor you are, how educated or uneducated you are. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff because God is not like man. He looks on the heart, not on the outward appearance. That means if you are willing to allow the Holy Spirit to start taking control of your life and start developing your character, he will certainly make a way for you, provide a place for you here in planet Earth to have a significant impact in the lives of other people, starting with your own family. Thirdly, according to God's ways, He always values character above appearance. I often thought if we would spend as much time grooming ourselves spiritually Sunday morning as we do physically before we come to church, we would be in much better condition to worship Him well. And then finally, since God evaluates us on the basis of our character, how do you measure up to God's standard? You may measure a 10 in the eyes of man. What do you measure in the eyes of God? Because He doesn't think like we do. He doesn't act like we do. His perspective is different from ours. He looks at the heart. Lord God, thank you so much that you make your word so clear. And we failed so many times measuring ourselves on performance or measuring ourselves on outward appearance, on the education we have, the degrees, the places we've been. And you just keep on looking at our heart and say, son, daughter, get your heart right with me. And then we'll go places. In Jesus' name, amen.